Welcome to the Heart of Dating podcast. Hey, it's Kate. I'm so glad you could join us this week as we try to untangle the ever so ambiguous world of dating as a Christian. Over here on Heart of Dating, we get real as we answer some tough questions and uncover transformative ways to approach Christian dating. Oh, and you better believe we have some laughs along the way, because last time I checked, the struggle is hashtag real. You know what I'm saying? Now, let's get to the heart of the matter. What's up, you guys? We are back with episode two of our series on sex. Babe, this has been a crazy week, hasn't it? It's been nuts. And the feedback from the first episode... It's been so good. It's been wild. You guys have been amazing. We we truly have been blown away at how much the first episode of this season really struck you and really impacted you and was healing for so many of you. Yeah. And, you know, my favorite part was, guys, we prayed so much. Yeah. We seeked so much counsel before we did that episode. The fact that it ended up the way it did wasn't an accident yeah it really wasn't and i i just we heard so many testimonies of like in just one week yeah yeah, literally the holy spirit was like with you guys it was healing and ministering to you as you listen that's just something that we can never manufacture yeah. on our own yeah thank you god and so here's my first encouragement if you have a friend that has been negatively impacted by purity culture that really struggles with sexual shame or who is just like has no idea about this topic of sex and it feels all very scary and foreign to them i really encourage you to send last week's episode me and jj's story to them because We're not just, this episode, just if you didn't listen, you should know that this episode is not just us telling you all the details of our sex life. That was not the point (laughs) of it, okay? The point was to tell you our journey, both before we ever met each other, our sexual past and our journeys there, the healing we had done in those, in both of our lives, how we shared that, our sexual past with one another, how we prepared for marriage and seeking healing, Mm. and how redeeming it was for us in marriage to have sex together, but also that that is not everybody's story. You know, some people don't have a great experience on their honeymoon night, and we're going to talk about that throughout the rest of the season, but my point is to send this to friends that need encouragement. We really, 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 I think the enemy tries to use this area of our sexuality and our sexual past and sexual shame as the the biggest area where he likes to keep us trapped in shame and condemnation and um, just being hidden and not being able to actually heal and walk into the fullness of what God has created. Yeah, that's so good. Uh, so if you guys are listening to this, this that episode is really awesome to share. If you are like in a small group setting with men, uh, for the dudes and for women, it's a really good episode to listen to, to kind of kickstart those conversations. We really hope the vulnerability kind of sets the tone for you all. Yeah. And then if you know a couple who's dating or an engagement or recently married, yeah. it's a wonderful episode to share just to kind of like, you know, pull back the curtain and really let you guys in on why it's so important to communicate, have really clear sex expectations, yeah, and really have no expectation, you know, except yeah. for, hey, God, how are you going to show up and use yeah. this? So, so good. So today, you guys, we are so excited because this whole series, we're talking about sex and 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 the kind of education we want to provide is education specifically for singles, mm-hmm. okay? Things that the church often shoes away because we can't allow the singles to hear because it's too much to even mention the word sex. They're going to stumble if you they're hear gonna the word stumble. sex. They're going to stumble. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and we just don't believe that. That is a very dehumanizing view of us as individuals. And we believe it's so important and healing to have these conversations uh, and start this healing process before you ever get into a relationship, let alone get married. So this whole series, we're focusing on so many different elements of sex, from sex expectations to the reality of sex on your honeymoon to, and it potentially hurting or not even happening, to um, 
porn and masturbation to lust and attraction to boundaries, all sorts of things that I know you guys want to know. And so today's episode, we're really excited because we brought on an old dear friend who's been on the podcast before and has a lot to say about this topic. And He just is going to bring us an amazing theological view of how God truly sees sex and why it's so important for us to really understand this before we ever get married. Because a lot of us, if you grew up in purity culture, you might be like me, and you probably had some weird teachings around sex that you need to heal and get right because sex is not bad. And so, right, babe? Yeah. (laughs) And so today we are welcoming Gary Thomas onto the show. Yeah, it's so good. So the way I would say to approach this episode is whatever view you have of sex, whatever you've listened to, whatever you've learned from culture, from your parents growing up, like you don't have to delete it all. But this is a wonderful episode to just clear the whiteboard saying, if I wanted to start from scratch, and building like a healthy view, healthy biblical view of without sex. Without shame, yeah. Without shame and just get the you know, concrete foundation from God's word. This is the episode. It yeah. doesn't say we have these views on sex. Let me go find how I can support it from the Bible. It says, hey, let's start at God's word. Yeah. Let's start at the Bible. Let's see what God himself says about sex. And how he designed it. Yeah. Specifically, which Gary walks us through in the episode, five different ways that God designed sex yep. for. And so let me read Gary's bio. Okay. Sound good? So if you guys don't know Gary, he's epic and he's a dear friend of ours, but I'm going to officially read his bio. So Gary Thomas's writing and speaking focuses on bringing people closer to Christ and closer to others. He is the author of over 20 books that together have sold 2 million copies and have been translated into more than a dozen languages. These books include When to Walk Away, Sacred Marriage, The Sacred Search, shout out every single person here should listen to that, (laughs) and the Gold Medallion Award winner, Authentic Faith. Gary holds a BA in English Literature from Western Washington University, an MA degree in Systematic Theology from Regent College, woo, my bestie's going there right now, and an honorary Doctor of Divinity degree from Western Seminary. He is a teaching pastor at Cherry Hills Community Church in Highlands Ranch, Colorado, and an adjunct faculty member at Western Seminary in Portland, Oregon. Gary's speaking ministry has led him to speak in all 50 states and nine different countries countries, and on numerous national television and radio programs, including multiple appearances on Focus on the Family and Family Life Today. You guys, he is incredible. This episode is so good, and we just love him. And so we're so excited for you to hear this episode today with our dear friend, Gary Thomas. And we want to tell you one announcement before we bring on Gary to the show. So School of Dating is our favorite thing to do in Heart of Dating. And it started last spring. It's an eight-week mentorship program that JJ and I teach together in three different phases. And you guys, the doors for our March 2023 program start tomorrow. Okay, so if you're listening to this, it's Wednesday, March 8th. The doors open Thursday, March 9th. If you're listening to this later than that, it may already be closed. And I'm very sorry about that. However, we want to encourage you that if you are hearing this and you're like, I want to find out more about this eight-week transformational mentorship program, get on our wait list. And how you do that is you text the word wait list to 214-225- 7772. And getting on the wait list is the best because it means you'll get the biggest discount before anyone else even gets offered the program. I know. And one thing, we're filming this in advance. There's a good chance that this round of School of Dating might not even hit uh, the public. Yeah. It might just be filled up from the wait list. So if you do want to get in on School of Dating in the future and you didn't, Get on the wait list regardless because we're going to reopen it in September. July. July. Yeah. And the second round? Uh, October. October. There you so go. So we're running it hopefully two more times this year and we don't want you guys to miss out on it. Yeah. So if you can't do it this round, no worries, but get on the wait list so you don't miss July and October. So basically just to give you one more thing, it's 
a very intensive program where we meet live for two hours twice a week, okay? We are there. It's a small group of about 30-ish people, and we are hands-on with you, walking you through the eight-week, 16 sessions of curriculum. You get a workbook. It is so incredible, and you will walk out a new person. Yeah. The testimonials from our past programs are insane. They're insane. And we believe in this program so, so, so much. So. Yeah. What we basically just say is it's like three years of change and growth and results in three months. Yeah. That's exactly. like really what it is. So go ahead and join that wait list. Um, guys, this episode is going to be great. We hope it really blesses you. Share it with your friends. I mean, yeah. it's an awesome one to digest over time, have discussion groups, and really, really partake. So can't wait. Let's go. Okay, we got Gary Thomas today on Heart of Dating. This is your third time on, Gary. Can you believe that? <laughs> well, I'm honored, Kate. Thank you. But this time is extra special because now we have JJ here. <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to be co-interviewing Gary today. I know. We're going to do the good cop, bad cop, you know, routine, <laughs> get him from all angles. But it's so fun because actually we met you together when we were still dating before we even got engaged. And then we went to dinner together and that was still before engagement. I was, little did JJ know, I was using that as a little bit of a test. I'm like, if Gary likes him and Lisa likes him, then maybe I will consider marrying him. No. Well, <laughs> we I were rooting for you well. both afterwards. Both Lisa and I in the car were saying, we hope it works out. And I mean, <laughs> yeah. he chose a beautiful place. I know it was by some... Some body of water. I don't remember what. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. In Lido. Uh -huh. In Newport. It's so beautiful. No, it was beautiful. And I think, yeah, Gary and Lisa definitely helped <laughs> getting in my corner. I don't know if they texted Kate on the side like, hey, don't mess this up. But I appreciate <laughs> it. That's what I like to think in my mind. <laughs> well, that was a fun time. That was a good moment. We had been dating like seven or eight months at that point. Uh -huh. Oh, that was so sweet. Well, at that point, I think Kate knew she wanted to marry me. Yeah. And so I don't know. Uh, I think I was pretty close as well. So it was a fun time and Gary and his wife, Lisa, joined us and that was a, a very memorable dinner. Uh, we loved it. And so it's been just awesome to be friends with you, Gary, for the last few years. And now we get to have a really fun conversation today, which... We are just so thrilled to do, you know, before this episode, JJ and I did a solo episode and we shared a bit about our journey together, which when we told people on the episode, we're like, we're no experts at this topic of sex. We've only been married like almost six months, six <laughs> months at this point. Right. But we have some things to share from our past and what it was like in dating and how we those conversations were brought up in engagement and the process we that we both took individually and then together leading up to getting married. And I think that's why we were so excited about this conversation today, really talking through having a shame-free, godly foundation of sex, because that is so important and is often not what's being, like, not what's happening. And so... uh we're, I'm so thankful for the work you do. I loved your book, Married Sex, with Deborah Falada, and she's also a good friend. So, so, so good. I also loved both the male and female perspectives. And so I think we should just dive right in. Babe, do you want to ask the first question? Yeah, I'd love to. So, <laughs> Gary, the first one we had for you is there's absolutely sometimes a real fear in the body of Christ that singles can't even hear the word sex, right? Because it might trigger something and they can't control their minds and imagination. And therefore, yeah. when it comes to these conversations about sex, we can't even have it, right? Mm -hmm. It's just like we shush them and chew them out of the room and it can even create like a harmful idea and foundation around sex, my sexuality. Let's just get it out there. What do you kind of think about that predicament, especially in the church? Well, it, it's funny because I remember when my son was maybe... 12, 13 years old. And I was talking to my wife says, I'm just not sure you should talk to him about sex at all. And I, I said, why? Well, I don't want you to put the thought in his mind. I said, oh, honey, <laughs> I love you. But do you think I have to put sex in the mind of a 12 or 13 year old boy for it to exist? It, it's going to exist. God created us mm -hmm. to be interested in sex. It's healthy to be interested in sex. The only thing we can really govern is the way 
we think about it. And if Christians don't talk about it, then whenever we think about it or hear others talk about it, it's going to be from a worldview that doesn't honor God. But um, let me put on my pastor's hat for a second here. Yeah. But I think we need to be kind to ourselves in the way we think about sex. Right. There's a difference when you're married. I'd say even a little bit of a difference when you're engaged and a difference when you're single and nowhere near getting married. In fact, Deborah Flade and I both independently were asked this question. We came to the same conclusion. We don't recommend single people read married sex. Mm. You know, you, you read it, Kate, where there are stories. It's not pornographic, but there are stories yeah. to help couples uh, that just give great ideas, which is what I love about a book. You'd never want a small group to sit down and say, OK, let's share what was your best sexual experience. <laughs> you know, you're, you're running from that small group. <laughs> With the anonymity of a book where you can change details and whatnot, it does help couples to say, well, this was meaningful for us and that was meaningful for us. I don't know that it's helpful for singles to think about it that way. And and Mm. it's just true to other issues in life. You know, like the the last 10 years when I'm not running two marathons a year, weight is always an issue for me. And I have such a sweet tooth and we don't really keep candy in the house (laughs) because I don't want to obsess about it. I don't want to have to keep saying no to it. It would just exhaust me. But this last weekend, we did one of Lisa's favorite things. We went to one of those home shows in Denver, uh, the Denver oh, Convention yeah. Center. And I, I got to, it's like Halloween for husbands. Because, <laughs> you know, to entice you to the booth, they have all my favorite can. They have the Tootsie Rolls. They have the peppermint, you know, the chocolate peppermint <laughs> things and whatnot. And, and Milky Way, little Milky Way things. And so it, it, it would be crazy for me to do that mm-hmm. once a week much less every day. I can usually, I I can handle it twice a year that they usually have. So so I think the same thing, I just say to singles, be kind to yourself. You're going to think about it. There are healthy ways and there are unhealthy ways. And you figure it out. Does this lead you to obsess? Does it lead you to what you would consider a fall? Or is it something where you can just appreciate God um, for what he made? You know, it's fascinating. Even over a thousand years ago, there was this great Christian classical writer that talked about when you see a beautiful woman and he's writing to men and a lot of monks, thank Mm -hmm. the creator that he can create such beauty. And when you turn it toward that way, not trying to pretend she's not beautiful or your senses don't go off, but it's, it's turning around to God creates beautiful human beings. And that one in particular (laughs) shows his handiwork, but that's different than obsessing and going further to where it's unhealthy for you and frankly, unhealthy for the person that you're leering at. That's great. You kind of presented both sides of that. Like, hey, we need to have healthy sexual knowledge of the foundation of sex and why God created it and that it's important. That's healthy. And there's a healthy balance with that, right? Obsessing over it, thinking about it all the time. I mean, that's going to be unhealthy when you are not in a covenant of marriage. And so there is that balance for sure. So, you know, and you write this in married sex and, you know, the reality is that God designed sex and he does love sex. He loves sex. But so often we find, and I got a, I actually was doing a Q and A today. I got a question where somebody was like, I have zero sexual desire. I don't even want to have sex at all in marriage at all ever. And I was like, wow, okay. We don't have to go through the, all the nuances of that right now. But I think that so many people are shut down to even the idea of sexual desire in ways. And I do think there is such a beauty to the reality that God created and loves sex. And so I would love to just see and ask you specifically in scripture, how do we see God's love for sex exemplified through the pages of the Bible? I think it begins with the fact that as important as prayer is to the Christian life, There isn't a single book in the Bible devoted exclusively to prayer. As important as finances are and giving liberally to the poor, there isn't a single book about how we handle money. In one sense, there's really only one book that has one central focus, and that would be the book we call the Song of Songs. That's the original Hebrew title. And the very title of Song of Songs is a sermon. Something of something is an ancient Near Eastern phrase Mm. that elevates what's being discussed. Most people have heard of God as the king of kings. What does that mean? It it doesn't mean he's just 
the wisest of kings or the strongest of kings. It means if you were to put all the kings of the universe together, God would be king of those kings. He's different in kind, not just by degree, but in kind. And so when the Bible, the inspired word of God, I believe, is discussing the erotic relationship between a man and a woman. I I don't believe the Song of Songs is chronological. I don't think it's about one couple. I think it's a series of poems. That's where most modern commentators are going. But when it's discussing, so we could say it's discussing the sexual relationship more than it's giving a, a, a biography or a narrative of a particular couple. But it is saying there is no other song in human experience like this song. Now, this is pre-Christ, which might be significant, but he could have chosen the Song of Moses, the Song of Deborah, the Song of David. But no, it's the Song of Songs that talks about the erotic sexual relationship between a husband and a wife. And when you think about what sex represents, it shouldn't surprise us. God is just being honest. It, it, it blows me away. You, you want to talk about being made in the image of God that a man and a woman, through one act, can literally create another human being that shares their DNA. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just awe-inspiring. Nothing Mm -hmm. else, you know, we we can make a great painting. You can make a great piece of pottery. uh, But making another human being is just amazing. Mm -hmm. We know what it does relationally. and We'll probably get into that in this interview. We know that it reminds us that we are made as physical beings. We have bodies and nerve endings, we feel very embodied when we're having sex. I mean, we're reminded of those nerve endings. We're reminded of what it means to feel pleasure. There are spiritual analogies. I I think just looking at sex honestly, it shouldn't surprise us that the inspired word of scripture says, there is no song like this song. Mm. So before it even gets into the book, it's preached a sermon on God's celebration. Wow. of sexuality. And then I love the way that the book honors both a woman's pleasure and the man's pleasure. In mm. the very second verse, Song of Songs 1-2, the wife says this, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is more delightful than wine. Mm. Now that word love is dod in Hebrew D-O-D. It doesn't refer to romantic love. It's not talking about the Hallmark Channel here. It's talking <laughs> about physical acts of lovemaking. And what, what's important to go back to 3,000 years to understand how powerful this is, because women today, you know, wine, they, they may not even like it, but just think of how many pleasures a woman 3,000 years ago living in a desert, which would be the audience, think of how many pleasures a woman like that didn't have. Right. <laughs> you know, wow. th- there, there was no... Uh, Caramel macchiato to wake up in the morning. She didn't even have Folgers. I mean, coffee hadn't been invented. No dark chocolate in the afternoon hadn't been invented. Yeah, I can't yeah. imagine my wife Lisa's life. No manicures coffee. or pedicures. <laughs> Probably didn't sleep on a bed. And at the end of a frustrating night, there was no real housewives of Jerusalem to chill to and <laughs> laugh at somebody else. I mean, they, they really had one pleasure that a woman could enjoy. Mm-hmm. And that was wine. Mm-hmm. And so we miss it today because women have any number of pleasures. Some might not even like wine. But this woman is saying, think of the highest pleasure a woman can have. It doesn't compare to my husband making love to me. Mm-hmm. And I just love that this book begins with pleasure for the woman first. God didn't create sex for the man where the wife just services the man or the wife has to give sex to the husband That's or right. he might sin. It was entirely God saying to the wife, the wife expressing her gratitude. <clears throat> this is for me. I, I literally have no higher pleasure than making love to my husband. Now, that might not be every wife's feelings who's listening to this, but it shows God's intention that mm-hmm. certainly sex is for the woman's pleasure. That's so good. I just love how like very, very quickly in God's word, when it comes to even Genesis or Song of Solomon or Song of Songs, like it is very quick to the point. Hey, here's the purpose. Hey, here's how we feel about it. Genesis 2, he creates Eve and Adam breaks out into a dance celebrating is very quick, right? It's the opposite of bashful. 
Mm-hmm. It's the opposite of shying away. And it's very quick to your point, something that we see left to our own devices and culture, the idea of sex is for putting out for the husband, essentially, and making sure his itch is satisfied. Mm-hmm. And we actually see the opposite in what you just said. And the great lie, JJ, behind that, Is if the husband is at all healthy, the most sexually exciting thing for a husband is a sexually excited wife. Yeah. Mm. The most satisfying thing for a husband is a sexually satisfied wife. Yeah. When he can leave her panting and spent with a smile on her face and said, I did that to her. Thank you very much. (laughs) Not not in a shame, but, you know, she's happy because she's enjoyed it. He's happy because he could help her enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And and we noticed that in our research for the book. Um, Look. Sex should be enjoyable for the sake of the enjoyment for the woman. I mean, she should just say, this is great for me. That's good enough. But I can't tell you how many guys said what it means to them when they can make their wife feel that pleasure. Mm -hmm. One guy says, it makes me feel like Superman. Now, again, that could be taken too far. And then it feels like she's just doing it for him again. But it it is the Bible's expression of it. It is for the woman. And then when it talks about for the couple, Song of Songs 5.1 is really powerful. When it says, eat your fill, O lovers, be drunk with love. It's literally a picture of God looking at a couple in the act of making love. There's no shame. There's no, oh, come on, guys. Can you invent Scrabble or Yahtzee or something else? (laughs) God is looking at this couple and he says first, eat your fill. In other words, feast on this moment. This isn't a time for intermittent fasting. All right. (laughs) This isn't a time to have one bite and to push the brownie away. Feast on this moment. Be drunk with love. I mean, it's look, be intoxicated. Let your passion take you away. Let it pull you toward each other. It's okay to let go in the healthy confines mm-hmm. of a healthy marriage. And, and frankly, for a woman to really enjoy sex, there has to be that point. Again, mm-hmm. in a healthy situation where she learns to let go for her to experience the fullness of pleasure. And even... Old Testament commentators aren't afraid to go there. The Hebrew is so strong. Let me give you two examples. Uh, Dr. Michael Fox said this, the term captivated connotes no disapproval, but perhaps it bears a slighty, naughty overtone by suggestions of strain, deliciously dazed, and the ecstasies of lovemaking. Dr. Bruce Waltke was one of my former Old Testament professors. And here he says the teacher admonishes that inhibitions be left behind in the marriage bed. Mm. Mm. So it's saying you don't have to be afraid of the intensity of the pleasure that you feel carried away. God created you to experience that way. Pleasure is a good thing. And, and and so we can celebrate it. We can embrace it. There are a lot of things you guys know in my books where I talk about expecting the difficulties of marriages and being true in the challenges of marriage. And, and that's true. Yeah. But it is a perverse view of God that he says, I want you to struggle. I want you to strain. I want you to be committed, but you don't get to enjoy the good stuff. Right. Exactly. <laughs> God calls us to experience and accept both. Yeah. yeah. It's so wonderful. And and I think just giving yourself the freedom to partake in the gift is, um, is really like one of those cherished moments and cherish acts of the Christian faith to partake in such a delicious act before God and have his blessing behind it. Yeah, um, yeah. So pleasure is very, very clear, especially for the woman and with the man that kind of comes as a byproduct uh, in the act of sex. Biblically speaking, if we were to build a foundation for a single, I know you talk about the five purposes of sex. Could you walk us through those mm-hmm. to kind of help build and complete that foundation? The first one is, well, the first one mentioned is procreation. Genesis 128, be fruitful and multiply. And here's the reason I stress this. In a Hollywood notion of sex and a cultural notion of sex, it's all about every time sex has to be better than the last. Mm -hmm. And you guys have been married long enough to know life doesn't work that way. (laughs) And, And it can cheapen a good activity. My wife and I, one of our favorite things to do is go for walks or go for hikes. Now that we're in Denver, I mean, they're just beautiful hikes that we're really enjoying this. How I would wreck every moment if afterwards I'm like, honey, was it, did you enjoy yourself as much as I did? Is that the best hike you've ever been on? And and we almost think that sex is supposed to be like, or it's becoming routine or whatnot. And here the Bible is saying, you know what? The first 
use of sex is pretty utilitarian. Make a baby. <laughs> or <laughs> uh, you, what I say to my premarital couples, you know, that first night, you're going to have a lifetime to really in- understand and enjoy it. But just consummate it. Get, kind of get it done. You're, you're fully married in every way. Every, don't put so many expectations on it. Yeah. Um, and, and now... Some couples have said they did great damage to their sexual relationship when they were trying to conceive. If it's difficult to conceive and sex becomes a chore, you know, the wife might take a shot. you got to have sex right then. It really, it, 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 but I, yeah. I, I'm saying, but that is one of the purposes. If you're trying to make a baby, which is a wonderful thing, um, but, but that is one of the purposes. And so right. I put that up front so that we don't, we, we get away from the cultural notion. But the second purpose is, if you read the Song of Songs, pleasure like we won't feel anywhere else. <laughs> uh, like like the woman saying, I, I, I don't have any other higher pleasure than my husband making love to me. So the Song of Songs talks about that in many passages. So we can accept the pleasure. We can be grateful for the pleasure. The third thing is it's relationally bonding. The Bible talks about the two will become one. We know neuroscientifically, as oxytocin is released, and and men tend to have much lower low, much lower levels of oxytocin than a woman, so a man gets an even bigger bump than the woman for this. In fact, I heard one uh, doctor say that a man will never feel closer to his wife than immediately following a sexual encounter because the oxytocin that's released in his brain just makes her feel closer to her than he ever has, which may. For the married couples, you know, sometimes women are wondering why guys are so susceptible to make up sex. <laughs> and he, he, here's one very likely explanation. He's terrified. There's distance. We're not on the same page. Mm. And he knows after sex, he feels so close to his wife. For him, it's a shortcut. Hey, if we have sex, I'm going to feel close. <laughs> the wife might say, what are you talking about? But um but that's sort of one explanation that it's his mm. appeal. I feel far from you. I want to feel close to you. This makes oh. me feel close to you. That's now, good. to the uh, to the singles listening, this is so important. Oxytocin is not only relationally bonding, which is what makes it dangerous before marriage, because you should be evaluating your partner, not yeah. bonding with them. Mm-hmm. It also has an amnesia effect. You tend to forget the other person's faults and sins against you. You don't want that to happen when you're dating. You want to remember everyone. You want to be able to evaluate them to see if this is a good exactly. fit. So certainly relational bonding. We, we know infatuation phase. 12 to 18 mm-hmm. months is a normal shelf life of an infatuation. What's so brilliant in God's design is that if a couple is mentally and physically faithful to each other, once the infatuation fades, they're having regular sexual relations and they're rebonding every time they do. And it's just, it, it's a great pattern. Mm-hmm. Uh, the um, the fourth thing, and this is tricky, and this will cause controversy, but I don't know any other way to read 1 Corinthians 7. And I just felt like I have to go where Paul wasn't afraid to go. Paul says it helps us live with sexual integrity. He says, if you're single, instead of pretending that you can date all these people and be faithful and you're leaving sexual casualties behind, he would say, you know, get married, make a commitment, build a life together. A sex doesn't fix a sexual addiction. If a man or a woman is sexually addicted before marriage, they'll bring it into their marriage. It might take six or nine months for it to show itself. But once sex starts to become routine, so it's not a cure for a husband. But Paul does say clearly that it's it's easier to live a faithful life if we're in a relationship where we can be sexual in a way that is connected relationally, spiritually, in our whole lives. It's healthy for us to be sexually engaged with each other. In the same way, it's very unhealthy to be sexually active outside of marriage. I think it does mm-hmm. a lot of things we probably don't have time to get into. So I do think yeah. living with sexual integrity is, a, is another purpose. That's great. Was, was there a fifth one too, or just four? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, I was like, I was, I, I, was, I wanted to I comment, tried, but I wanted to make sure. I know. I think all of us here are like, oh, we <sighs> want to double click for the people who like to twist that one, but uh, <laughs> we'll reserve it. Well, yeah. and especially when you talk about sexual issues, it's so difficult because 
people like to attack and, and it's hard to have nuance. Yeah. And, and yeah. so I, I don't want to take either camp. I don't want to exactly. say that getting married fixes a guy who's right. got, it doesn't. I've seen it as a pastor. I, I refused to marry a couple because I felt like the guy had a porn issue that wasn't addressed. Yeah. Um, so that's, I'm not saying, on the other hand, I don't know what else you can say about 1 Corinthians 7, as Paul's saying, instead of just being frustrated all the time, right. find a good marriage. Don't, don't sacrifice the quality of your spouse to get married sooner. That's, yes. that's a bad move. Exactly. Right. There are other things that you can do, but take that energy that you would spend maybe sexually acting out and pursue a healthy relationship. Okay. Mm-hmm. Enough with that. Five is just a picture of Christ in the church. Paul gets in this yeah. Ephesians five. Uh, the church throughout its history has read Song of Songs as uh, an analogy of the church's relationship with God or our relationship with God. That's problematic to me in some sections. Mm. I can think about my wife that way. I'm never going to think about God that way in some of those passages. But it's been done enough to where I think in general, you don't get too specific. There's a part of that. Um, and Dr. Julie Slattery, who I so just She's revere amazing. her insight and wisdom is really, I think, prophetically reminding us that the sexual relationship is a picture of God's covenant love. Mm-hmm. And, and it calls us to a relationship just as, and this is the difference between sex and the hookup culture, just as sex should call us into a committed relationship. We want to be sexual, so we need to find a committed relationship. The hookup culture circumvents that. Yeah. And so it leads to something unhealthy. All of those points were so, so, so incredible. And I really love the last one, especially because really pressing into in covenant, the reality that sex is uh, a reflection of God's love for us and our his desire to be connected to us. And it's almost like a sacrament. I know I've heard Tim Keller talk about that, like sex is in ways a sacrament in marriage and really understanding how sacred and divine this thing was designed to be. Yeah. Because if we can come to that, if we can come to really understanding that and revering that, it gives us as Christians a deeper why for why this is such a holy thing to wait for it for marriage. Yeah. Like it is, it's so incredible. And, and I, we, JJ and I shared this on our episode because I have a sexual past and JJ's looked very different than mine. And a lot of people ask me like, how did you, like, how was it? You're, you're the first night of sex with JJ on your honeymoon or whatever. <laughs> tell it's us so everything. Funny. <laughs> I'm like, everyone asks all the questions. But what I tell people, it was like, even if you have a past and a history, I can tell you, you've never truly experienced sex. You truly have not. Because, and I, I heard that said before, and I, I was like, I believe sacred that. Sacred search. Right? Oh, yeah. Oh, I quoted God. Dr. Stephen Wilkie. Who okay, talks there, a couple of that there we go. <laughs> and, but I, for me, I experienced it, like, truly. And now I'm here to, like, tell people, like, yes, like, what JJ and I experienced on our wedding night and in our honeymoon was unlike anything I had ever experienced ever before. What the Song of Songs shares and what JJ was in that in that night was so profoundly beautiful and healing and different and holy. And you can't even imagine what it can it is like in marriage, in a safe and a beautiful, godly connected marriage. And so it is sacred and divine. And it is worth waiting for. Like it really is. Even if you've had it in the past, you know, it's like re recommitting yourself. But I think part of that is understanding why it is that it is sacred and why God has designed it in such a way. And so um, I just, I want to kind of transition that into saying if you have anything else to add there, because on understanding the sacredness of sex, because I think that's the missing piece Understanding the sacredness of sex and a deep why is what I see as a missing piece, as well as removing shame, those two things. That it's a missing piece in people really connecting to hold fast and true to saving themselves to marriage. Mm. I, I'd say that fifth point, seeing sex as a picture of God's covenant love, is the difference between eating processed plastic food mm. and a really wholesome meal. Yeah. They're both considered food 
but the experiences before, during, and after are dramatically different. And what it's meant for me as a man, okay, mm-hmm. which which I loved after reading Julie's books and, and being to a seminar with her, mm-hmm. I must be as faithful to my wife as God is faithful to me. Mm-hmm. I must yeah. be as committed to my wife as Christ is committed to the church. And it's easy mm-hmm. for some of us, we start to say, well, I don't look at porn, so I'm good. But this calls me to something entirely different a new kind of faithfulness, a new kind of covenant, a new kind of commitment. And so I would say, put down the erotica books about a billionaire who really doesn't have to work, but he satisfies your every desire. (laughs) Guys, stay away from the porn. That is, it's giving you an appetite for plastic processed food that's making you sick. Uh, Don't settle for less than God's best, which you two have experienced as you just described All right, guys. Hey, it's Kate here. I hope you're really enjoying this episode with Gary Thomas. He's one of me and JJ's faves. But really quick, I want to interrupt this episode to tell you about our sponsor today, which is AG1. I take AG1 by Athletic Greens pretty much every single day, you guys. It is incredible. I tried it out originally because I just needed something that gave me the vitamins that I needed and immune boosted my immune system, which if you know my past, I used to get sick all the time. And now my health is really in a better condition. I take AG1 in the morning before I start my day. And you know, you guys, I love me some work, but I need to start my day well. So it's really, really easy because it makes me feel like I'm doing something good for my body right in in the morning. Very quickly after starting this journey about a year ago, I noticed improvement in my digestion and my hair, my skin just looks so much better than it did before I started this journey. It's the healthiest thing you can do for yourself in under one minute. Also, my AG1 is delivered to me every single month, so it's been really easy to make it a daily habit. I get the single serving travel packs as well, so I never have to miss a day even if I'm on the go and traveling. I just mix the powder into ice cold water and drink it in the morning. That's it, super, super easy. If you're looking for an easy way to take supplements, Athletic Greens is giving you a free one year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Go to athleticgreens.com forward slash HOD. That's athleticgreens.com forward slash HOD. I want you to check it out and let me know how it goes. When we talked about our story and I said, one of the biggest things that I regret about pornography that I had to heal and rewire my, my brain and my attraction on was it taught me that sex was about me Mm -hmm. and instantly gratifying my desire and the Institute Song of Solomon one, two, everything about sex and the way God designed it was the opposite. Mm-hmm. And, and that took, that's, you know, that was a decade of programming on my end that I had to work through. And so I think you, you two just hit the nail on the head why it's so important to grasp that sex is so much more than just a physical act. So once we understand the why, once we understand the purpose and the covenant, it kind of introduced us to, okay, now we're quote unquote, explicitly or not explicitly right to wait until marriage. So how does understanding the absolute sacredness of sex change our why or our conviction? Louise Perry is a British writer. I don't, she's not writing from a Christian perspective. I don't know her view of faith, but she wrote a brilliant book last year, The End of the Sexual Revolution, Mm. where she said women have been conned by the hookup culture And one of the myths that she takes on is that there's nothing special about sex. It's like a handshake. It's like playing tennis or something like that. So Mm. it it doesn't need marriage. It doesn't. And and she does it with one, I think, brilliant illustration. She says, if sex isn't special, what's behind the Me Too movement? Mm. We all know there's a difference between a boss telling a new hire, hey, could you please get me some coffee or make some copies? And turn around so I can get a good look at you. There's something that we know there's something. Why? Because sex is different than asking somebody to share a cup of coffee. So I I, I think when our culture says it's not different, it's not very consistent because 
bosses get blamed for that, and rightly so, yes. um, because we recognize that there's something different um, in that request. And, mm-hmm. and then I would say why it's more than that. And again, this is where, and Kate, this is addresses you when you say you had a different past than Paul, where the purity movement went wrong. Mm-hmm. They made it sound like um, if you have sex before marriage, you're ruined. You know, you're right. the rose. It's been about the tape that doesn't stick in you. You know, all of those yeah, all the analogies. Yeah, all those horrible analogies, yeah. <laughs> Paul, who believed in the redeeming, recreating power of Christ, would never think that, mm-hmm. much less say that. When he says in 1 Thessalonians 4, not to engage in sexual immorality, what's his main point? And in this matter, no one should wrong a brother or a sister. Mm. Paul's not saying you'll be wrecked. He's saying don't harm your brother or sister in Christ. I want the church to be ripped up because there's something different about Christians who aren't married having sex than taking a walk by the river or watching a movie. There there just is. The Bible says Mm. there's something different. We know there's something different. And mm-hmm. and so I think it's just recognizing we've been lied to when we think mm-hmm. that we can treat sex as not different. Louise Perry talked about how women trying to behave like men will warn each other. She said she's read so many articles, and I like, I don't read women's magazines, so I don't know. But she said there are a ton of them about what to do when you get the feelings. Mm-hmm. You know, trying to have sex without emotion, trying to have sex with feelings. And so they have to write to encourage each other. This is what you do to avoid that. So oh, it, wow. it's not it's not physical. It's why we want to wait. Uh, we talked about the amnesia effect of sex. Yes. Uh, look, the whole point behind the sacred search was please make a wise choice. Right. So much yes. of your future happiness and enjoyment, and I would say fruitfulness in ministry depends on making a wise choice. I don't want to be bonding to a woman and have amnesia effect. Because yeah. I'm being intimate with her. Just want them to be evaluating. Is this someone that I want to raise children with? Is this someone right. I want to minister with? Is this someone I want to wake up next to uh, for the rest of my life? God created sex to help us bond and rebond, uh, not to jumpstart intimacy right. and, and do it. And I noticed, look, I don't, when I'm with my daughters on vacation, I'll watch The Bachelor, The Bachelorette. I, I don't remember the last time I have because I'm not with them very much. But I can see when one of them, I think, is particularly immature because they'll immediately jump to making out. Yes. <laughs> it, it, they're not dealing with the issue. It's just they start. And then and I'm just like, you know, that that's that's kind of running from what that's the opposite of what you need to be doing right, right. now. And then immediately the amnesia. There was like a situation and then they just started making out and then. They don't actually address what actually was on what they should have addressed. Right. And I mean, to your point, that is helpful in marriage in ways. It's like, oh, I have amnesia. <laughs> like, uh, I forgot what you did yesterday that annoyed me or earlier today. Great. But not in dating. <laughs> not right. Hard. And in and fact, we go back to that whole thing about makeup sex. It works. <laughs> it makes you feel close. Now, you should still, if you want a healthy relationship, go back and figure out what is this conflict? Right. How do we resolve? You want to be healthy and deal with it. But as far as the feelings, it's going to work mm-hmm. for the guy at least. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it works I, for me. Yeah, sure. it definitely works. <laughs> and then you get um, a great, nice, neutral arena to go back and step and talk about the actual problem. So I want to bring in also, um, unless you had anything more to say on that, I want to bring in also, because we mentioned even with the purity culture and, you know, all the horrible references to use goods and this, that, and the other, there there was for many people, especially a lot of people listening to the podcast because they are very much the prime people who were affected by the purity culture movement, myself included. Um, there's so it did while it had good intentions. I've said this so many times. There it did have some really bad outputs, good intentions, bad outputs in many ways, and it caused so much shame. So while we have the cultural standpoint that it's just sex, it's transactional, it's just this physical thing, and it's for myself, which we've just debunked. Then we have the other side, uh, the extreme side of the purity culture movement from back in the day where purity is on the pedestal, right? And it is like the ultimate. And if you have 
done anything to go against that, you are now damaged goods. But not only that, if also you've never engaged, you are like righteously better. And, um, you know, so either way, but also there's even those people. And I have a friend who is in her mid thirties and she's struggling. She's never really had any sexual encounters and she's like, what and she's struggling feeling so much shame about her body just in general because of again that movement and so how do we separate shame for for people to really cuz to get back to this foundation to the why the thing that's standing in the way in many ways is that big block of shame that block of shame that needs to start being healed and removed in order to really in marriage enjoy the fullness of sex. Well, one of the big lies of the purity movement is that if you abstain from sex before marriage, you automatically have a great sex life after marriage. Right. Anybody that's been married, and Deborah and I stress this in the book. Yes. A great sex life isn't because of what you didn't do before you got married. It's because of what you do act on after you're married. It takes a lot of work. You got to keep working it. So it's not like this wait until the day and then everything is easy. It's not easy. The second lie, and I got to give Dr. Julie Slattery credit for this. I think it's a Mm -hmm. brilliant deconstruction of it. The purity movement divided people into two camps. Those who were virgins on the day they got married, those who weren't. Mm. In a biblical worldview, there's one camp. All of us need the grace of Jesus Christ. And she stresses, Mm -hmm. all of us are sexually broken. Now, Julie said, you know, she kind of felt okay because uh, she was a virgin on her wedding night. But she thinks for the first 10 years, she, her sexual brokenness showed up in not enough interest in sex, really struggling with things and whatnot. She goes, that's as sexually broken as somebody who had been sexually active before marriage. So I think yeah. recognizing that we're all on a journey, how do mm-hmm. I deal with my stuff, whether I was abused, whether I made some choices whether I was led into choices or or whether I'm self-righteous. In fact, Julie said when she was talking to a young woman, she says, I would rather a young woman be be with a a man who knows he's broken and has repented and has been healed and is depending daily on the Holy Spirit than a self-righteous guy who judges everybody who didn't have the discipline that he had before they got married. I think the future looks much better for the person that's humble than the person who's uh, self-righteous. I'm not trying to promote my sub stack, but I did a whole hour long interview with Dr. Joyce Skarka. She did her doctoral dissertation on sexual shame in women and why it's so increased with women. For instance, yeah. women have made to be have made to um, feel like they're responsible that if it becomes sexual, it's their fault. They're supposed to be the gatekeepers. Yeah. If they look at porn, they think only guys are supposed to look at porn. Something's right. really wrong with they, they carry an inordinate amount of shame. And mm-hmm. so she talks through um, how well recognizing it at one woman who heard it, because I use it for seminary class said, it's just so freeing for me to realize she's been where I've been and there's a way out. Jesus mm-hmm. points a way out. And she talks about how marriage can be very healing and what a husband needs to do to make it particularly healing. Um, and that's uh, what just, was, tell me her name again. And Dr. Joy Skarka, S-K-A-R-K-A. Mm. Um, the, the sub stack is Gary Thomas books.substack.com. And it's, okay. it's on the free side. So that's great. We can put it in the newsletter. Yeah, no, well, I love right? it. I mean, I'm all about sharing more resources and that is such a good point. And we don't have time to get into it today, but in further interviews, we're going to be talking through also just there's it, more shame and body shame, even especially in amid women and how that also really impacts. I mean, for guys too, guys have body shame as well and shame, but in that way, but it really can deeply impact how we're connected to ourselves and our bodies and then able to, to be able to even connect sexually with our husbands one day. Mm-hmm. And so, um, babe, do you want to ask this next great question? Yeah, I do. Yeah. So this is, this one's really, really interesting. Mm-hmm. And I'm excited to ask because Obviously, coming out of the purity culture fallout, you think about that pendulum that swung really, really far to the purity is on the pedestal. There's two camps. 
and then swinging back, right, not the middle, but swinging to the other side of this teaching that, you know, we should really embrace our our sexuality, our sexual nature. It's good after all. Let's let's explore it. Um, so the question for you is, you know, should we, especially in singleness, this is for the singles, should we embrace our sexuality? And if so, to what degree and how? Um, because the opposite, and I know I did this in singleness, I said, hey, God, thank you for my sexual nature. Please shut it down <laughs> and, until I get married. Like, please, I thank you. I know it's a good thing, but like, it's just, I, like I surrender it. And so I I think we must embrace our sexuality. It goes beyond our sexual acts. But what I really love about what you said, JJ, is I, I think it's irresponsible when Christians spend so much time tearing down the purity culture movement, which I think was well intended with some disastrous conclusions. I'm recognizing the heart, particularly for women. It wasn't an equal opportunity offender. It's far more terrible toward women than it was toward guys. But not critiquing hookup culture doesn't help people either because we see people just as messed up by the hookup culture philosophy as they were by the purity movement. If if I could go back to Louise Perry again in her book, The End of the Sexual Revolution. Can I just summarize some of her points? Yeah. Because I I think she does this so good. First, she said sex is special. We already talked about that. Mm -hmm. Uh, about the whole Me Too movement. Second, she said, and and this is considered radical these days, that men and women are different. Strength-wise, the way their brains operate and whatnot, the way they approach sex. She talks about the social sexual desires, which is a desire for variety. One of the examples she uses is that there's no lesbian equivalent of gay bathhouses. Mm -hmm. Women are looking for something different. Now, You will always find exceptions. When you talk about differences between gender, you can go too far. But in general, it's just helpful to understand women and men are looking at at different things and for different things, and it means different things. And she said our cultures had to deny that to support hookup culture, but it's not true to life. Mm -hmm. The third point she makes, I won't go through all of her. She has eight, but let me do a few. The third one she makes is a bold statement that Christians have to believe it's true. She said some desires are bad. Mm-hmm. Our, our culture teaches it's shameful to deny yourself. Not that you should be ashamed of some desires, but she said removing shame from some desires has led to horrendous things because we have some shameful desires. I would say uh, pedophilia is that. There are violent acts that are that. There's degrading acts that you see in porn. And I've seen this as a pastor. Yeah, Jada, when I'm when I'm working with a guy who's seen a lot of porn and he's asking his wife to do something, and I'm just thinking. You know, 99%, I think what happened is you were in a heightened state of sexual arousal and you attached desire to this act. If you hadn't have been conditioned that way, I really don't think you would ask the mother of your children to do that. Mm -hmm. I really don't think a woman that you truly expect respect, you would want her to engage in that. Porn disciples men. It has an agenda. It's hidden. It says, here's your desire and there'll be fulfillment. It has an agenda to shape your view of women, to shape your view of self, to shape your view of sex. And I don't like the people behind porn. I don't trust their agenda. Um, I trust God. One of the things that Perry says is this, the radical desires of sexual liberals do not work in a world in which human sexuality is not always beautiful, but often wicked and repulsive. Uh, if we desire wicked things, repression is good. It's not wrong. It's not unhealthy. It's healthy to repress myself if my sexual desires leads me to violate or disrespect or demean another person. Uh, a fourth problem with um, hookup culture is that loveless sex is empowering. Louise Perry says mm-hmm. it, it's not empowering. And, and she says the whole lie that casual sex is good for women Um, just doesn't prove true. For one, female pleasure is rare during casual sex. About 10% will orgasm as opposed to about 64% uh, in marriage. Casual encounters prioritize male pleasure, not female pleasure. Mm -hmm. Um, And and she says it's just, it's been great for men, not great for women. Two more real quick. And this, this next one's the big one that I've seen that she gave me a new vocabulary for. 
our culture removing sex from God has said the moral standard is consent. As long as two adults are consenting and not hurting each other, it's, it's wrong to deny it. The Christian worldview is, does God consent? Because God mm-hmm. created us. God uh, knows how it's there, yeah. but it's not. Um, but here's the problem with consent why it doesn't always work in the world's view. I, I had a woman talk to me at a sacred marriage conference. It was heartbreaking. You could see the, the light and the love of Christ in her face. But she told her story of having been sexually abused as a young girl. As an adolescent, she became hypersexual in response to the pain. Yeah. And then she was making, they call it amateur porn or homemade porn, something like that, because she thought it was empowering. Well, I'm doing this now. This is me. She becomes a Christian. She realizes how messed up that was. Mm. There's no way she can get those videos back. Mm. So she's not giving her consent. Even though she gave her consent, she posted them. She thought it was empowering. Now that she's healthy, she realized, no, that's not healthy. It's not empowering. But it's out there. And so she lives with the reality that some guy sitting next to her in church may have seen her. She doesn't consent for that now. And, and so this notion that just because the woman consented, it doesn't mean that she still consents. She might have been traumatized or victimized. Louise has this whole litany of famous porn actresses who rallied for porn, who went to rally saying it's healthy, it's empowering. Now that their career is over, this is so debasing. This is degrading. Linda Lovelace was part of debates. Wow defending porn. Um, And she said, everybody who watches Deep Throat is watching me being raped. Wow. So um, the way that Louise sums it up, you can do terrible and lasting harm to a consenting adult who is begging you for more. Mm -hmm. Um, I I, I think I get into that whole BDSM thing. Even if a woman is asking you for it, if it is based on abuse and hurt in the past, the most loving thing you can do is say no. Right. And then trying to get your spouse to do something that feels demeaning to them or hurtful to them. No, that's not healthy. Um, so consent isn't a good, it, it doesn't replace God's right. view because we're fallen. And then the sixth point that she makes, which is very radical to our culture, she says, okay, all of these things being true, what does this tell us? Marriage is good. <laughs> the, the culture thinks marriage is the problem. Marriage is bad. Women need to be liberated from marriage. And she says, in reality, it is the healthiest place um, for us to be sexual with each other. That it, it comes back to, you know, marriage has its challenges. Marriage has covered up abuse. Marriage has resulted in some women being demeaned or condescended mm-hmm. if the guy doesn't respect them. I go back to Winston Churchill. It wasn't his statement, but he popularized it. Democracy is the worst form of government except all others. <laughs> I think in some ways, marriage is the worst form. The demands and responsibilities is the worst form of relationship between husband and wife, except for every other one. <laughs> it's the healthiest way to be sex. So I'm not denying that some marriages have been whacked out and hurtful, but as fallen people, who want to be sexual, God's invention of marriage is brilliant and right and true. So purity movement needs to be critiqued, but the hookup culture has been a lie. Mm-hmm. Louise Perry told her grandmother what she was working on. And I loved her grandma's response. She hadn't read the book. She says, Louise, women have been conned. <laughs> Men got what they wanted, uh, you know, free, guilt-free sex without responsibilities, and women have paid the highest price. Now, I'm, you know, I'm not the best to address women with this. So let me give you two resources that mm. single women can look at. Julie Slattery has written a book called Sex and the Single G- Girl. If yeah. Julie's written it, it's worth reading. She's Marion so Jordan, who I also know, has written a book called Sex and the Single Christian yes, Girl. Yes, I love Marion. Yes. So two very close titles, but I think if single women are dealing with this, um, they could they could find some healthy positive biblical truth there. Mm, that's so good. Yeah, I love that. Wow. I hope everybody was taking notes. I know. I was sitting here like, <laughs> that was so good. We'll include all the resources. Gary, if you have time for like one or two more things, um, 
I love it. So, you know, I've seen and heard a lot of singles. They're like, okay, so if they're this far with us in the interview, congratulations. We're happy you're here. <laughs> but, you know, we've walked through the why. We walked through, okay, how do why it's so important to remove shame, some resources for that, acknowledging that purity culture did put a lot of shame and especially women were the result of feeling more of that shame than men. Um, and if the single is listening right now and they're like, I'm either doing that work or I feel in a good place that they, they understand their sexual desire is good and created by God, who is a very good God, then I am single and I'm in my thirties or I'm in my forties and I'm not married. And how do I not harbor resentment towards God because I'm waiting to have sex till marriage and it, that thing has not come yet. Because that's what I do see, you know, for many reasons, a lot of resentment in singleness from singles. But if we're talking about in the lens of, you know, waiting for marriage, um, waiting to have sex, how do they um, work through that resentment? Look, this is this is personal to me, Kate. I have a 35 year old single daughter. So mm -hmm. it's not just theoretical. I see the frustration. I see the hurt. And I want to be gentle when I say this, but firm enough to make the point that there isn't really anything special about sex in regards to other disappointments. I, I get the, the desire, but, but throughout life, there'll be many long-term disappointments. In a book I, I just had come out, I talked about a couple who wanted to be parents their whole life really trouble conceiving, finally conceived one child. He died when he was 19. Oh. They'll never be grandparents. They'll never have a daughter-in-law. Mother's Day and Father's Day are really painful days for them. It's not sexual, but they are living with that till the day they die. When I was, I was married and having sex early on, I so wanted to be a writer. I went through eight excruciating years before I could get anything published. Um, I, I talked to a couple where the wife had a dysfunctional background, so she marries this inordinately strong guy. How, how much can you bench press, JJ? Uh, <laughs> Maybe you don't want this, okay. <laughs> no, no, I, I can flex on everybody. I'm probably about like 280. <laughs> could, that's a lot, okay, just really, that's a lot. Daryl could push up 400. Oh he got gosh. over 400, which is a lot. I mean, an NFL, I'm, he was diagnosed with MS three years mm -hmm. into their marriage. Mm -hmm. The wife wanted a husband who would make her feel safe, who would protect her, who would carry things in for her. And he's been, you know, disabled in that mm -hmm. way for a couple decades oh. in their marriage. So I, I don't want to be insensitive that it is hard to be desiring sex and not being able to experience it. I'm just saying, welcome to humanity. Yeah. Uh, does that sound too harsh? I'm not, I'm not, I, I'm just, we're, we're all going to have issues. If you become sexually fulfilled, you get married and some of these other issues will come up. A couple that had been really wealthy in their thirties and forties, gave away millions of dollars, now going into retirement, living paycheck to paycheck, renting a home from one of their sons, mm. it's humiliating to them. And so what I would say is God gets it, lament, that's fine, ask him, use that energy to try to find a healthy relationship, find other ways to self-soothe um, that are healthy. You know, mm. you're, you're into books, you're into horses, you're into knitting, you're into riding motorcycles or climbing mountains or, you know, whatever it is, find ways as these couples have in other ways, um, they go away usually on vacations on the anniversary of their son's death. Oh. Uh, they, they built a home in another country that has his name where they do things, but they've just found ways that, okay, this really hurts. What yes. can we do not to take away the hurt? That's not an option, but to make the hurt a little more bearable. Mm. Yeah. I, I wish I wish I could have three steps and just pray and zap yeah. people, but I just I'm old enough to think some seasons in life have to be endured. Yes. You somebody going through cancer treatments and whatnot, uh false words aren't helpful. 
Mm. So I feel, I feel for those. I hurt yeah. for those. I know it's real. It's a part of living in a fallen world as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's part of being human is coping with the reality that it is broken while we are on earth. Yeah. And that is the degree of faith that we still have a good God who did not make a mistake Yeah. with my body, with this situation, mm -hmm. with this pain, with this cancer. It's not a mistake. Mm -hmm. Well, this has been so incredible. We've covered so much ground today <laughs> to really break through and talk through, you know, a shame-free, godly foundation of sex. There is, and this is when we, coming back to what we said at the beginning, when we shoot singles out of the room, you know, and are like, oh, we can't even say the word sex without it, like, being weird. Uh this is why I want to wanted to have this series because we need to start with this foundation to then be able to say, okay, we're going to have deeper conversations from this point first. You know, like this is, we need to start here. We need to be on the same playing field. So for the listeners here, this is where JJ and I stand. Gary is so incredible. And like, we just really hope that you learned so much today, that your eyes were open, that healing is breaking through, that there's so much for you to continue to process. And and I know there was a lot. So re-listen again and take more notes. But I really, really hope that this will just be a new foundation or a start of a new foundation to help you on that journey as we continue to talk through sex in the coming weeks on the podcast. Yeah. Uh, and Gary, I'll put you on the spot. So if you're a single listening to this, <laughs> we probably don't recommend married sex. We've established that. Are there any other books of Sacred yours? Search. Yeah. Um, so obviously Sacred Search, <laughs> one of the best selling. What other books? would you point a single to specifically on sex as well? Well, those two for women, Julie Slattery's and Marion Jordan's, I think you're safe with. JJ, you might be more help to me because like I've been married 38 years, so I wasn't reading books <laughs> for single guys. It's been decades since those have been relevant. I don't know that I can think of any. Um, I do know a lot of singles have read Sacred Marriage just to yeah. get a different view. Of if you're mm -hmm. going to choose marriage, a different view of marriage how God uses marriage to shape you and form you and whatnot. I, I think that would probably be the one um, I would I would point them. Yeah, I think so too. I think Sacred Search and Sacred Marriage are are wonderful books. Yeah, you can really even look up, you know, uh, really any Tim Keller sermon, <laughs> right, about <laughs> sex and the the creation. Uh, yeah. I think those are great places to start, and hopefully, this series will be super enlightening. It's built for singles. And the idea of sexuality and the foundation of it. And yes. so, but once you're married, married sex should be one of your first things on your Amazon Prime orders. <laughs> okay. I did think of one. I haven't read the book and I hate to recommend books I haven't read, but I've heard the guy. He seems really top notch. J.P. Pak Luda. Oh, J.P. Yeah. 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 I don't yeah. know the title of his book, but I know he's written one for singles. Outdated. Yes. Outdated. He's a good friend of ours. Yes. Um, oh, yeah. We love Outdated. Okay. That's great. Yes. Outdated is a great resource if you guys haven't gotten that. And of course, Sacred Search and Sacred Marriage. Well, Gary, ah, thank you so much. It's been fun, guys. I'm just excited for your journey. So <laughs> we're so, grateful. We're so and, grateful. And there's been a few people that I've met so far in the Heart of Dating journey, especially now as I've started working more with Kate. She's a CEO. I'm the president. So <laughs> let's just, we always have to mention that, right? <laughs> oh my God. She's got you. executive authority. But there's, there's a few people in the journey of Heart of Dating that have really contributed and made it what it is today. And that's obviously Kate in partnership. And then there's just a couple people who've been super faithful. And Gary, you were absolutely one of those people. Yeah. So on behalf of Kate, Heart of Dating, the audience, and now myself, thank you so much for your time and your willingness to educate and serve singles so well. Yeah. Like I love what you said about Sacred Search. If you could boil it down and we absolutely stand right beside you in this message to choose wisely yeah it is a lifetime gamble there's so many you have no idea how often we quote you and your phrases and your stories and your anecdotes so we're just eternally grateful yeah. in our time on earth for your help and service thank you the heart of dating podcast is created by kate warman it is a part of the converge podcast network our incredible editor is the one and only scott caro 
Our theme music was developed by the amazing Christian Ledoux. If this is your first time listening to the podcast, or if you've never written us a review or ranked us on iTunes, we'd encourage you to do so because it helps us so much to get this podcast into more people's ears. We launch our podcast each and every week on Wednesday, so we'll see you next week. This show is part of the Converge Podcast Network.